Hello, everyone. Wow, I didn't expect us to be that many. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy. So thank you for those that have renamed. We have Italy, we have Germany, we have Indonesia. Wow. Um, we have Singapore, we have Berlin. So it's right for me to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all of you. Uh, from wherever you are joining us. And uh, welcome to this session on migration, um, migration technology, data protection, and the invisible borders. Um, to start the session, um, I would like to say that um, with the various aspects of migration, the perceived or non-perceived complexity on migration, um, various organizations, and especially the AU, has been impl implementing various technological aspects in um, in migration management. Um, these technological aspects have come with the promise of effective, effectiveness, efficiency, fairness, and protection. The question that we are going to be dealing with here, however, is can technology be neutral, for instance? And does it impact people equally, especially people from yeah. multiple communities? And how does fairness then and protection work in a society marked by great inequalities. So with this question, I would like to ask the various teams to, um, the various people that I'm talking with to introduce themselves as we jump into this discussion, yeah? So can we maybe start with, uh, from the top there, we start with Tutiano uh, and Dorina. So please unmute yourself and uh, we can introduce yourselves. Hello, everybody. Uh, we, um, we're from Berlin. Uh, I'm Dorina and Stiziano. Uh, we work for Mediterranean Berlin, uh, which is a very live and uh, kicking part of Mediterranean Italy. And uh, we work in the migration uh, sector. Mediterranean Italy is in sea rescue, so we, uh, we save migrants trying to cross the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And we have a boat, which is now unfortunately blocked um, due to Italian governmental obstacles that are actually unnecessary. But uh, when this is not happening, we are trying to do our best and to make uh, people know that uh, human lives matter and then uh, human lives are worth saving. Um, despite all the governmental problems, despite the European uh, policies that are not always helping, uh, we're trying to do that. In Berlin, we have formed ourselves as an organization, as an association, an FAO. The ones of you in uh, Germany know what it is. And uh, we're trying to um, take care of the theoretical part of the migration project and migration initiatives that is also uh, things related to inclusion, related to uh, integrating uh, people, relating to raising awareness about the situation of the, the migrants, about sea risk in general. We have created contacts with uh, Zeebrücke and Sea-Watch, SS Mitterrandi, some other NGOs in, uh, in the same sector, and are trying to uh, make civil society more aware of what's happening and also try to reach an, um, a political level and um, help realize uh, that uh, decision makers have to do something in this respect. So it's not only uh, this kind of um, support we need on a theoretical basics, basis or so, we need the, um, the decisions uh, of the politicians to make things happen and to help people understand uh, welcoming migrants and taking them in from um, the first point they reach Europe, so in, in Italy to Germany, that this is an important thing and this uh, must work and must be made possible in, uh, within the European frame and politics. Thank you so much. Um, with Tatiana, we'll be talking about invisible borders, border controls, and uh, how human dignity and human respect is covered there. And next, I would like to introduce, uh, uh, oh, sorry, um, Tatiana, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, we please say a word. Yeah, no, thank you, <laughs> Thomas. <clears throat> thank you, Dorina. No, that's uh, that's correct. Um, thank you again to uh, for letting us uh, join this uh, um, uh, unexpected uh, meeting. And it's nice to see that actually the, the proper way to uh, say hello to everyone is good morning, good afternoon, and good night. And this is uh, the, the 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 nice part, uh, the nicest part of uh, this uh, uh, meeting us. Uh, and uh, this uh, represents as well the the, the full uh, 
um, voyage um, that uh, jo journey that um, all the the people and movements uh, have to to cross uh, uh, as well so uh, this is from a symbolic point of view this is um, uh, definitely um, very uh, relevant uh, as Verena said as well and uh, as uh, Thomas said uh, we were born uh, two, two years ago Mediterranean so we are a relatively new fresh uh, organization uh, here in Berlin we started just uh, one a year ago but in Italy we started uh, all this at least the two three uh, crazy people that started with this whole idea uh, they reacted to the fact that uh, um, Europe and Italy was uh, basically looking at the other way around uh, after uh, the Mare Nostrum um, um, uh, policy, uh, European policy uh, was decided to, to, to quit. And uh, as much uh, as, uh, as soon as uh, the new uh, minister at that time, uh, um, um, Interior Minister um, Miniti started uh, this uh, externalization of the of the borders by doing uh, agreements uh, with uh, Libya and on the European side, as we saw, uh, the same was done by Angela Merkel with uh, Erdogan. Uh, and today we see uh, something uh, similar uh, in Greece, even though in uh, other by other means. But uh, we see basically pushbacks are the, um, the reality every day, and um, uh, the. Um, uh, tortures uh, among uh, the the, uh, the borders uh, and uh, going against uh, human rights is uh, the is the rule today. So we are going against the rule that Europe established for uh, itself. Uh, let's not talk about the Convention of uh, Geneva, uh, mm -hmm. uh, where you will be um, uh, for sure uh, always. Uh, already uh, aware of. Uh, as I want to, to just to, to make um, a quick uh, closure, uh, it's a referment to this that um, uh, Mediterranean was born with the uh, necessity actually to uh, disappear as soon as possible because Mediterranean is doing something uh, on the civil side that the European states are not doing. So our mission is to be not necessary anymore and that the humanitarian corridors uh, uh, can uh, work uh, probably uh, properly on uh, on a state uh, level on a European level on uh, an institutional level. Until this is not uh, reached, we will uh, uh, we are working for it. And that's why we we decided to buy a boat, um, a ship, uh, which is not something really easy. We are talking about a lot, a lot, a lot of money <laughs> and uh, like numbers that. Uh, uh, make our uh, ears full, uh, but uh, which uh, definitely um, lets us understand, of course, the uh, importance uh, of what we're facing here as, uh, um, as, as a mission. Uh, again, we, are, um, we, we were born five years after uh, the shipwreck of Lampedusa in order that this won't happen again. Yeah, no. And thank you again, think Thomas. Yeah, we'll go back to that again. Let me let me just introduce briefly the rest of the team. Um, Sorry. Uh, so it's okay. No, it's okay. Uh, Lida, please. Um, you are working on a project um, with uh, with the various organizations in Kenya, uh, dealing with urban refugees and and the various aspects that um, that uh, that affect the urban refugees. Please tell us about your organization and and briefly introduce the work that you do. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Linda Bonio. I'm based in Kenya um, at the Lawyers Hub. We work on um, tech um, and the law. So we have different programs that we run. Um, however, before I founded the Lawyers Hub, um, I was an immigration lawyer working on two fronts. Um, one on the um, on the commercial aspects, um, helping people set up in the country, different organizations and individuals that were you know, looking to marry, work, um, and study in Kenya. So I did that for um, about six years. Um, but then also we got involved in the humanitarian aspects of um, migration. And so we belong to the um, urban refugee sort of network convened by the um, UNHCR here. Uh, it involves a lot of organizations that are, you know, it's a multi-stakeholder organization or a multi-stakeholder convening that brings together different, you know, um, people, um, maybe those who are working on social protection, um, those who are working on the law uh, and looking at how do you provide legal services to refugees. Um, ourselves, we've been part of observing um, a few cases um, um, on uh, refugee status determination with uh, 
with the UNHCR. Um, and so um, I think we've got some bit of, you know, um, experience within this particular area. They have monthly meetings, which have also been, you know, um, escalated to almost weekly meetings. I sent a few invites and I'm hoping that a few members of that network would, um, would be here. Um, also, I think on just the front on mobility, um, I was once denied a visa to the UK um, and I made such noise over it on social media. Um, and so I got into just the depth of, um, you know, how algorithms work and access to visas for Africans. Um, and I think that discussion needs to be had on, um, when you talk about is tech fair, I think we, we need to really talk about um, the neutrality of technology um, that actually gets you moving to another country. A question that we are going to be talking about, can technology be neutral? And, and that's something I'll come back to you again. And then we'll also talk about um, the invisible borders and in which uh, you have talked about uh, quite correctly that uh, sometimes are not um, in the countries people want to move to or not at the borders of the Europe, but actually in the countries, um, for example, in, in Kenya, due to the very complicated visa applications. We'll talk about the experiences again. And um, let's hear what Peter says about now, migrating within within Africa. Um, so, uh, Peter, if, um, if you hear me, please um, switch on your video if possible. Uh, I'll talk mainly about uh, experiences of um, um, using technology to, for instance, apply for visa. You know, um, I, I will not talk much about traveling between Africa and how technology facilitates this or hinders this, but uh, technology in applying for visa from, you know, wherever you are. Uh, in most African countries, uh, my experience is that, um, you know, um, technology, computer-based, uh, internet, and, and so forth, are uh, sort of urban-based. But um, um, for many embassies, you know, in Europe, um, what I found in, the, in Ghana particularly, and also in other African countries, if you want to apply for a visa, for instance, to go to other places, uh, particularly Europe, uh, you have to apply online. You know, the German embassy, for instance, in Ghana, you cannot apply anywhere else apart from online. And, uh, you know, if, if you are in rural area, for example, uh, um, Biosa or Bunkrugu in northern part of the country, it's, it's about 500 kilometers to the south to find good internet or to go to the city, to find a hotel, to sleep, and to apply for a visa there, you know. And, and in Kenya, you know, when you are in a very remote areas, things like that can really turn you off. And uh, you arrive sometimes, um, you know, you, you, you want to book a place, then it's the, the booking is taken up. The German embassy, for instance, you know, you want to book and, and the, the, the place is taken up. You cannot do anything else. You have to return and so forth. So um, this is my experience about technology mainly uh, in, in issues of migration. I think this, this issue has tended to put a lot of people off in the, um, pursuing regular migration. Actually, my, my experience is that a lot of visa processes that involve strict use of technology has certainly put a lot of people off to try um, uh, the route of regular migration. For instance, you know, um, uh, when you look at the German embassy site, uh, the German consulate in Ghana, they will tell you that if you try to misuse the system a bit, you'll be blocked and you can never apply for a visa again. You know, and, and for somebody in the rural areas who is uh, struggling with internet and so forth, you may have to type in one or two things, two or three times. But if you do that and you're not careful, you are blocked and you can never travel elsewhere. So, so I, I think, uh, you know, um, the use of technology particularly have to be uh, looked at in terms of uh, accessibility of people from different parts of, of, of Africa you know, different parts of um, countries in, in Africa so that uh, we don't unnecessarily uh, hinder the free movement of, of people. I think that's what I would, I would, I would say for now. Okay, wonderful. Thank we'll come back on that. We'll come back on that again on, 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 on positive alternatives to, to irregular migration, especially talking about um, your research and the work you do on agriculture economics. Um, so let's, yeah. I don't know if we have Rhoda online, um, um, and so Rhonda, if you're online, please um, uh, introduce yourself and let's talk about um, your aspect of um, rural urban migration and especially in regard to, to women 
and uh, how does it affect uh, communities in, uh, when people move to urban centers? And what are you doing in order to, to mitigate the various um, uh, uh, problems or challenges that uh, arise? Rhoda? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rhoda from Ghana, um, specifically Tamale, that's the northern region of Ghana. And um, rural urban migration um, in this aspect of the country is um, actually affecting most of the young people a lot. Um, one of the reasons why people, or let's say the young people move from their communities to the urban centers is because um, there is poverty at home and that they move in search of jobs that can fetch them money. Most of um, the jobs found in the rural settings are basically farming. And if everybody is farming, then the question is, if all of us are farming, then who is going to buy our product? So sometimes you get them moving to the urban centers in search of jobs. Others also move in because of education or better life. Especially with the women in the northern region, they migrate to urban centers to become headquarters. The same reason, just because they want to get money to be able to come back home and to support their family or because they want to buy their items so that they will be able to get married. Because in the northern sector here, if a woman is getting married and she doesn't go to the husband's house with some basic things like the bowls, that's a kitchen uh, utensil, then she isn't considered as a good woman. So most of these girls at that age move to go and look for money that will enable them to be able to buy some of these things. And there are a lot of challenges when they move. They move, you get to the communities, you don't get a lot of youth there. So if an organization or let's say a project is coming into the community to support the youth or to get, engage the youth, you end up not getting a lot of them because they are all in the uh, urban centers. Then these women that are found in these urban centers, um, the challenges they face are a lot. Some of them do not have places to lay their hairs on. They sleep on the streets where they are being attacked, they are being raped. So most of them, you see them carrying children that they do not even know who the fathers of these children are. They come back sometimes and they are not able to actually come back with what um, and, and they, they thought they would get. So sometimes friends do also um, um, encourage them to do that because their friends get there and what they come back with, they see and they are also eager to be able to get they, to, to get to the level at which their friends are, but they get there and realize that it isn't uh, what well, well, it's not all that guilt is that is good. So most of these young girls um, with us in Northern region here, it has been one of our major problems because if at the age of 13, at the age of 14, a young girl is also giving out for marriage because the parents cannot take care of you at that age. They feel that you, you are grown enough to take care of yourself. So what they just do is that they just leave you to manage on your own. Sometimes children at that age ask their parents for money. And what they tell them is that, are you not grown enough to also take care of yourself? Thank you. So are you not grown uh, enough to take care of yourself? So at that age, you even be surprised that parents are even, uh, are even expecting that their young girls even give them the money. So what will a young girl do at that time? she has to also go out and look for the money. So those who are not ready to marry, they are those that we see them also migrating. And those that are also, they agree to marry, they are also faced with a lot of challenges. So we are looking at all these issues that these young girls are facing. How can we do to help them? How can we do to support? What will we do to support these girls so that their future can also be bright? So we realized that skills training is something that will be able to help these girls. Mm, but the kind yeah. of skills training we are talking about here, they are found everywhere. Yes, yeah, skills training, there are hairdressing, there are tailoring. Why don't we just engage them or pay for them to learn? We need to look at what kind of skill or what 
is there that we can do so that these girls can be able to get money within a period of one year so that it can support them. So we came out, we established the Songba Empowerment Center where these young girls are engaged in skills training. So we get them from the communities. Girls that have been rescued from child marriages are brought to the center. Girls on the street are brought to the center. So within a period of one year, if you are able to produce beautiful clothes, if you're able to produce nice clothes for us to sell, then we help you sell it. Then we save the money for you. So Thank you so much. Yes, Lona. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, go on. Sorry. So within that period, you are still learning, but you are also making money. So that is one unique thing about our center and that of the other vocational centers that we have in town. So our center is a rescue place for these young girls because there is no place you can go to get a trainer any money during training. So with these young girls have, are, making, uh, uh, are making enough savings that at the end of their training or at the end of their stay with us, it will help them to purchase the equipment that they will need to start themselves up. Because their presence at our place, we are using our own equipment to train them. So when she leaves, what equipment will she need to start? Definitely we have to help her save. So they are making enough money, they can support their families. Some currently are making up to 1,000. Just within a year, they are making up to 1,000, which is good money at her level. So if she's able to stay in the center for three years, how much will she make? This alone, is helping them to see or is, 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 is making these girls see the benefits of the skills training and also what mm. discouraging them from traveling. Because at this time or at this point, there is no girl at our center that you will ask her to choose between what she is doing at the center and migrating. And she will tell you she will migrate. As I speak, I can boldly say that there is no girl at the center that will say that she prefers migrating because we've made them to see the relevance of staying back at home and making good use of your talents. So um, yeah. I think um, I get the point that um, um, there is um, there is this aspect that um, the urban centers are over. Um, there are no jobs for people to migrate into the urban centers, and due to that, you are offering alternatives for especially young girls and women to to, to have a source of income. Um, that's uh, very nice, um, but I'm going to ask you, at least because we are, we are quite many of us in the, in the discussion, I'm going to ask you later about that and how it impacts the community. But I would like to come back to the, to the aspect of invisible borders, uh, where I could like um, 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 uh, the Mediterranean, uh, Tiziano and Dorina to talk up, to, to tell us about what's the experiences in the pushbacks that uh, we are experiencing, and if the new initiatives that have been brought up by the European Union, if they are really there or are they considering the protection of people needing protection or do you feel the pushbacks are rather in the aspect of the European Union? Pushbacks in terms of um, uh, the policy regulations, in terms of um, um, control and return of uh, migrants. Yeah, uh, well, mm, as we said before, um, pushbacks is basically the unofficial uh, <clears throat> politic uh, um, policy of uh, of the European Union. So mm -hmm. basically, there is no plan. Uh, they are afraid in Europe. Uh, each country is afraid uh, of uh, each uh, uh, Salvini or um, uh, AfD or any Le Pen, uh, which might increase. Uh, their votes. Uh, so since they don't have uh, any project of uh, um, integration or of uh, humanitarian corridors, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, have, um, uh, let's say, under um, under the, the, the table, they do another kind of uh, policy. Uh, we have just the news of uh, uh, many, uh, so just not even a, a week ago, the, that uh, Fabrice Legeri, the head of Frontex, mm -hmm. uh, which is the agency for the European borders, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, who should control uh, actually only these uh, policies uh, on, uh, on the borders uh, and uh, respecting always the um, the human rights uh, actually was accused from uh, uh, the group of the socialists of the European socialists uh, that uh, he should, he should uh, they ask him to uh, to resign uh, uh, because uh, the uh, the thousands of proofs have now arrived so email uh, um, 
and not only uh, phone calls, uh, uh, that there are connections between the head of Frontex and who knew and uh, ordered basically the uh, uh, Greek Coast Guard and the Italian Coast Guard uh, to coordinate basically pushbacks. So now we even have the proofs. Till now, uh, this work was done by the NGOs. So not only by the SAR NGOs, so the search and rescue NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, not only Mediterranean, uh, because we have to rem remember that if it was only for Mediterranean, this, this couldn't be work. So they always have to be a joint work, mm -hmm. uh, but we could see it this one uh, with uh, our eyes so uh, we our boat uh, received um, we were shot from the uh, from the guns uh, of the Libyan coast guards uh, while we were trying to uh, save uh, uh, people uh, or boats uh, in distress we were asked uh, to uh, to stop and hold back to to give them uh, uh, the people a movement to give them back but uh, we we of course didn't uh, didn't accept so uh, on uh, on one side, we have Europe uh, saying and repeating that they have to reform uh, the Dublin uh, uh, Pact uh, uh, rule, uh, uh, which means that the first country um, uh, of contact of the, the migrants should be always even the one who should be uh, registered in. Uh, we are officially saying that we need to respect uh, um, uh, to relocation programs. Mm -hmm. um, we officially, as European Union, uh, repeat that we have to respect um, human rights and then we see that uh, uh, we uh, even have on the borders uh, inside Europe so mm -hmm. not only outside in the ex mm -hmm. new externalized new borders mm -hmm. uh, which was an another example with Miniti in Italy um, mm -hmm. so not only with this we see it now in, in Croatia in Bosnia uh, where we see it in Serbia that uh, people are uh, moving, are going uh, in in the back on the Balkan route. They go to Italy, they get rejected, and so they fear another uh, kind of torture even on these uh, new borders. So officially, we say one thing. On the other side, since there is mm. no real plan uh, mm. to relocate to make an integration, mm. we constantly abuse about uh, um, on uh, on uh, human rights. And uh, this is the official real uh, uh, European policy. Yeah, yes, let me ask add, this it's, now. Um, just let one uh, quick thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been also proof that the German police has uh, taken part in this uh, pushbacks, mm -hmm. um, where, where the, the Greek territorial waters are. Mm -hmm. So the, this is the policy they actually um, apply in order to keep the borders safe. Yeah? And you, we were talking about invisible borders. These are the let new borders ask. of Europe mm -hmm. right now that are being conserved like that. And Turkey mm -hmm. is another part of this uh, situation because with the pact that was made by Germany in, uh, in Europe in general mm -hmm. in 2016, Turkey has become a very vivid part of the, the European borders and they have been keeping migrants from reaching uh, the European country where they can actually stay. So they are being kept in uh, miserable conditions just so that Europe can stay safe and conserve its uh, precious waters. Yes. Now, the question I'm wanting to ask Lydia Mbogonio, because she is a lawyer and very involved in migration and tech. Some of the aspects that are being used to manage this migration, um, uh, to do manage, uh, migration management are collection of data. And a huge amount of data are collected also in the areas in Turkey, in Italy, where Mediterranean mm -hmm. is involved. And you have talked about the aspect of human rights. Leader, what rights do these individuals have? Do you... Okay, um, I think on paper, everyone has a right to, to move, you know, that right to mobility we know is, is absolute, uh, but it's, it's not necessarily in reality. Um, mm -hmm. We've had countries sort of close off their borders and mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's actually not, um, you know, it's, it's not um, expressly indicated that you can move to these particular countries, but the process is pretty bureaucratic that ensures mm -hmm. that you don't go, you don't move mm -hmm. countries. Um, mm -hmm. Those are processes that are really expensive. If you try to get, you know, a, a, maybe a work visa or a tourist visa, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard. Um, I'll give an example from um, my experience, you know, yes. um, traveling to Germany um, or just getting a, um, a Schengen visa would be maybe between you know, $60 um, mm -hmm. to maybe $80. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have access to different countries within the Schengen area. Yes. Um, compare that to move, going to the UK for a few weeks 
I'm going to the UK for a few weeks. We're going to set you back $160. Um, and you pay that before you even get the visa, you know. So I personally lost $160 when I was denied that visa. And my, my, um, I have insisted that, you know, Africa should not lose that much amount of money for mm -hmm. a process that's done basically online mm -hmm. um, to apply for a visa. Um, the other aspect of data that we have in determining these visa applications, for example, is um, the UK system doesn't give you the opportunity to appear before maybe a consul or a, um, a migration officer to give you the, your answer. This mm -hmm. is basically an automated process. Um, and you, we know what um, is involved with automated processes, um, the use of data and, you know, um, machine learning. We've had places where you, they can't listen to your story. They simply, the algorithm decides that you know, you're a woman, you're not married, um, you're high risk, you're not going to come back. So in my case, I remember at that particular point, I had about $15,000 in my bank account. Mm -hmm. And they said that I am broke, that I'm not going to come back to Africa. And I thought, mm -hmm. please, um, your algorithm is just biased. Regardless yes. of the money I'm going to have in my account, mm -hmm. they still will not give me a visa. So I, I think that there needs to be questioning of, um, you know, algorithms that are used to um, determine visa status within mm. the African continent. Um, and I also see this with, um, I also see this, I saw this with the um, Black in mm. AI conference in Canada. Um, yes. Canada has been accused um, of the algorithmic bias mm. in issuing visas. So we had this people from Africa who are, wanted to go to the conference Black in AI, just yes, yes, yes. here. Um, their visas were denied um, and it was, it was such an oxymoron that mm -hmm. how do we get denied by the same algorithm we're coming to discuss about in your in your country? Yes. Um, yes. So I think that there needs to be um, you know further um, in, interrogation of the technology that is being used by different countries, um, mm -hmm. and also maybe strategic litigation to ensure that uh, there's no continued use of these harmful um, mm -hmm. and biased algorithms. We've seen in in the UK, for example, um, mm -hmm. Foxglove, which is an organization that works on um, public interest litigation, mm -hmm. took the Home Office to court. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have now um, more people prodding algorithms around migration. I think yes. we need to have more about that. And then finally, I think on data protection, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of data that people are giving up just for them to travel to different countries. Yes. Um, if you compare what it will take you coming from Germany to come yeah. into, into Kenya, you mm -hmm. simply just need your passport and, um, and $50. Um, meanwhile, I need to produce my bank account. I need to produce my title deed. I need to produce my children's um, birth certificate. That's yeah. unnecessary data that shouldn't yeah. be kept. Um, and this just doesn't, doesn't apply to economic migrants like us who just want to try out countries and tourists. Mm -hmm. um, refugees are giving up so much data and some of this data is already lost in, in during flight when they're fleeing their countries. Yes. Um, we have seen technology systems within UNHCR, mm -hmm. which is now... Um, they have this centralized system where mm -hmm. if you came into fast report in Kenya um, as a, an asylum seeker, yes. uh, you're not able to do the same in Uganda because sometimes we used to have people sort of double as, this, yes. as a shop for a country, as um, you're talking about people who come in into Italy and they figure out Italy is too broke, I'm mm -hmm. going to be an asylum seeker in, in, in France or in Germany. Mm -hmm. Now we have such a centralized tech, tech system that ensures that you sort of register in the first country of, 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 that you land in after your flight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what needs to be done within the, um, this community and the tech community is to understand mm -hmm. and, and you know, require that because um, technology that is being used to have people you know, migrate, there needs to be a little bit open um, mm -hmm. for interrogation that these algorithms are not intellectual property that mm -hmm. can't be questioned. Um, you know, so those are my few thoughts around, um, around maybe data protection and also to indicate that migrants have a right to be forgotten. You know, um, those mm -hmm. features around data protection that mm -hmm. you can't use data Mm -hmm. um, then go in and um, you can collect data and you don't tell me you're going to use it for, use it for this purpose and mm -hmm. then use it for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. The United States is now collecting social media data to determine, mm -hmm. the, you know, these applications. That does not need to happen. When I share my data with Twitter, I don't intend to have it shared with the, with the Americans and getting the visa to their countries. So I think that there needs to be more um, and more discussions around what data are we giving to these particular embassies? What more are they getting from mm -hmm. party, party platforms? And is mm -hmm. it possible to get in the difference between, between the two?
Thank you. Now, so what are you, are you talking about? You're talking about um, data minimal, minimal like uh, I, I just have the word in German, data minimalismus. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Yeah, um, data and, uh, yeah. That you don't need to collect data that you actually will not use. Um, exactly. And you know that data collected is potentially data uh, mm -hmm. compromised. There can be mm -hmm. a breach in the data that you're collecting. We also have principles around the right to be forgotten that people yes. can actually delete. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right to erasure, that people can um, let a, a government know that please, you have to delete every data that you collected um, mm -hmm. because I'm not sure that um, these organizations are um, actually observing data retention policies. Yes, such yes, as yes. Mm -hmm. um, even as, as I continue speaking, I'm seeing the opportunity for uh, those who are working in migration to mm -hmm. again, you know, engage in these new areas of law um, and technology mm -hmm. around uh, data protection, um, data protection impact assessment. Yes. That what's the, what's the impact of collecting data of a particular community? Um, mm -hmm. Does it have any impact on national security? Because some of this data can be compromised, um, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, in, in different in different countries. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work that could be done, and that the lawyers have. We are really keen on advancing this conversation that can we uh, further explore the work that people like tech fugees and you know um, your organization are working on can mm -hmm. we take migration and technology to the next level can we get data mm -hmm. on let's say internet penetration and mm -hmm. mobility um, from the research we've had in Africa by mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of this organization but they said they indicated that um, uh, you know people in Tanzania are actually not moving even out of the continent mm -hmm. um, but you know people like Nigerians are really moving out of the continent so mm -hmm. is there that relationship between access that um, Rhoda was talking about access mm -hmm. of internet mm -hmm. um, you know compared to the mobility of people and you know trying mm -hmm. to move to different countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much, Lida, for that very, very, very good and uh, input on on data protection and uh, migration and tech. Um, the question now I would like to to ask uh, Peter. Um, Peter has moved around Africa um, in, on his um, in, during his research. Did you have a different experience in terms of application and visa application processes in um, in comparison to what Lida had to go through, uh, almost giving up the DNA for no, in order to get the visa? Sorry, sorry, can you ask again? Internet was dripping. So, leaders, ex uh, leaders talked about stripping. experiences of um, of her um, of her uh, visa application mm -hmm. and the process she had to go through, and her friends going to Canada or going to to UK. And one of the aspects you mentioned is the use of algorithm, um, and which I'm really going to come back to to to, to Mediterranean about that again. Um, what are your experiences when migrating regionally or continental in Africa? Did you, uh, did you go through the same? Was the experience different? Was, or what could you say? Uh, can you hear me? You like the internet. Can you hear me well? Oh, we can hear you, but the internet is breaking up. Yes. Oh, no. No, no, no. I, I, I think, I think the processes of uh, well, my perspective, the processes of. Uh, oh, so, I, so sorry. I, I think the processes, my personal experiences, the processes of traveling within Africa. I've been to Benin, Swaziland. Uh, I've been to Benin, Swaziland, uh, Kenya. Uh, you know, just a few. But my personal experiences, personal experiences, that it's, 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 it's much easy. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I wouldn't say easy, but less difficult to travel within Africa. Um, but I think it's also because of the AU policy of um, visa-free entry to the, the aim of AU to uh, make entry to each African country free. For example, Ghana, for instance, you don't need visa for all African countries, don't need visa to enter Ghana. I think Kenya as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think because of that policy, traveling within Africa, um, has become less difficult. I wouldn't say easy, but less difficult. And I think there's a very good thing for, for Africa that we can be mobile within our own continent. So um, my experience is that, of course, some countries have stringent uh, regulations. For example, uh, Kigali, when you arrive in Kigali, your passport is so much scrutinized, you know. Uh, but in other African countries, once, you know, you have the, 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 the passport and they check and you don't need a visa, it, it's fine. You're an African and you, you go. 
But uh, generally, I think uh, I've been to Germany as well, but uh, my experience even arriving at the airport uh, in Frankfurt um, wasn't, wasn't easy. Uh, my personal experience was, you know, um, I was made to, to stand somewhere for over an hour, you know, and I was taken through a lot of, you know, here, thumbprints and blah, 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 blah. So forth. So, but uh, I, I think in, in Africa, it's, it's, it's less difficult with my, my experience. And I think it's a very good thing, actually, that we can move within Africa freely and know about ourselves, the opportunities that we can explore, not only in our home, but in other African countries. I'm in Kenya here, I'm Ghanaian, I'm in Kenya here, and I've seen a lot of opportunities you know, that I can, I can um, um, explore in Kenya. Well, thank you very much. So that seems there are ex there are differences, and that uh, it seems Africa is developing towards or um, developing towards the right direction of uh, um, uh, in access to or um, um, increasing mobility within Africa. Now, Tetsiano, in regard to data, um, you have experiences with various uh, asylum seekers and refugees traveling towards Italy. You have been involved in saving some of those uh, people who have been stranded in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the question that I wonder is, what minimal data is required in order to be able to give protection to those people who require protection? Um, what do you think is the minimal data that the EU should actually be asking for? This is a really good question. I will not thank you for this because this is uh, not even uh, an easy uh, question, but uh, for sure, uh, what we know is that uh, we um, all the decisions uh, when uh, asylum uh, is, uh, is asked uh, are based uh, on the, 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 the story and the history uh, said in first person of uh, the, the people of the movement. So um, as you we, we, we had the chance to speak before, there, there's not uh, they are not always free uh, to, to, to say what they uh, what they want to say. Uh, memories uh, are, as well are not uh, always uh, at its uh, top uh, form. Uh, you are afraid to say the wrong uh, words. So mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, one of the reasons uh, why uh, the people is uh, often uh, even uh, rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, since we are, uh, they are appealing to uh, the, 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 the law, yes, of course, but it's always uh, an interpretation of uh, our... Um, uh, um, uh, offices and uh, bureaucracies that, that uh, decide uh, there in, in place uh, who is uh, uh, allowed to be uh, believable and uh, who is not. Uh, for sure, uh, if we want to speak about uh, data in, uh, in, um, uh, from a, uh, an external point of view, we know that uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, not being 18 uh, years old is already a good part. So age is uh, one uh, uh, is uh, let's say the 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 the, uh, the, the word that uh, helps helps uh, being uh, accepted uh, for sure. Because for those special uh, not uh, accompanied uh, minors, it's always uh, easier. Um, and that's why there's always uh, a double check on, uh, on this uh, for sure from, uh, from, authorities, from authorities. So this is uh, an aspect that was really uh, taken in consideration. Mm. Um, but uh, on the other side, there are uh, really few um, uh, elements that, that can be uh, mm -hmm. considered sure. Uh, for for this uh, from this point of view, so it's always uh, a personal experience. It's always uh, uh, related to uh, how um, the officers will uh, will decide uh, on that uh, specific day, and uh, it's actually more a political decision than not a real statistical and data uh, uh, or decision taking on statistics uh, and uh, or. Or, or data on or on uh, on fact, so it is uh, really depending uh, on um, on the political situation of uh, each time. But as we said, there is no plan. There is no European clear po policy about this. There is no Italian clear policy about this. So their wish will always uh, uh, um, the will of these uh, of the countries of the Italian government as well, and doesn't have to change. If there was. The, the um, uh, the socialists uh, uh, ruling the the, the government uh, or the country or the uh, rightest uh, uh, part. Um, it's a political decision not to 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 decide not to take any decision. So the chaos helps.
creating this emergency. Thank you very yes. much. I, um, I would like to say, so about the data, Italy is not well organized uh, mm -hmm. as to how much data what they need from uh, the migrants in order to make mm -hmm. them you know, like better pass. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany, um, Greece, they're a little bit better in this respect. Uh, but even if you have documents, uh, they run double checks because there's always the, let's say, the double or the, the intersectionality, the discrimination that you might have like a terrorist background or that you might mm -hmm. be some kind of danger for the country. So even if you may have documents and may, may be able to uh, identify yourself, there's always this um, suspicion. And uh, it's it's not always easy to just you know be treated like a human being, even if you can identify yourself as as one. So okay. um, the situation is not really. Um, I want to read you to read you a quote from one of um, of Angabian um, Angabian um, refugee who was in Italy, um, asylum seeker, and um, he he was saying that um, the police do not recognize we are too black. The police do not recognize us. Even the computers do not see us. Um, now, a question to Lida. Do you think technology is, is discriminative? Um, I, th I think um, any technology would totally depend on um, what data sets are fed into it. We've mm -hmm. seen um, the discussions around um, algorithmic bias. We, mm -hmm. I think this, this week, the whole discussion around Google and um, you know, their AI leads. And mm -hmm. we, uh, we obviously, I think, um, have gotten to the point that we don't believe anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, like this tell us before that because it's technology, it cannot be played around with. It can be played around with. And mm -hmm. it's basically on data sets. If anybody that's feeling this data set is biased, then the data is going to be biased. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think what we need to ask for, you know, moving forward, um, mm -hmm. there's been discussions in Kenya, for instance, around ICT practitioners and how they need to be regulated. Mm -hmm. We also have all these stories, you know, in the U.S. especially around regulation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the best thing that we could do is to start to question um, data that is being fed into technologies. I think um, um, the discussions around AI and ethics, um, you know, um, open AI, I think we need to be really involved in that. Um, and especially how it affects, you know, migration, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that it's not necessarily... Um, that we don't necessarily sit back and say, you know what, it's by Google, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, we need to ask procurement issues that mm -hmm. if this particular embassy is mm -hmm. using this technology, mm -hmm. we need to find out how did they procure it, mm -hmm. you know, who's behind it, what companies behind it, how, what mm -hmm. data sets are they fed into it. I mm -hmm. think that's really good. And we also must get into some sort of representation and look at diversity in terms mm -hmm. of these technologies. Um, we've had now airports now have facial recognition software, mm -hmm. you know, Soon we'll be like those, you know, Gambians who say uh, the technology cannot see us because mm -hmm. um, the developer is not African, the developer is mm -hmm. not black, and therefore they will not recognize you as a black, you know, as a black person. So mm -hmm. I think um, law could help us by just saying, um, let's stop with the intellectual property because companies have indicated that, you know, um, algorithms are intellectual property and they should not mm -hmm. be torn apart because if you tear it apart, that's the secret to their success. Mm -hmm. But we need to tear public interest algorithms apart and be able to see this is where it's biased. This is how we can improve it. The discussions we've had on Twitter about how, you know, the, the algorithm is biased and they will always show a white person and not a black person on a particular picture. Those are the discussions that we need to continue to have around the issues of migration. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So um, what you can see from this is that um, we, have, um, um, we have come to, to the point that there are invisible borders that are not only technology-based, but they are also process-based, meaning that in the application processes, the processes are so difficult and so, um, and so, um, and so um, demanding that sometimes it becomes very important to, um, to, 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 to get a visa. So, and then we have talked about the outsourcing of borders where Tiziano uh, Mentrania has talked about the Turkey, um, the, the, the referring of policies to the Turkey government uh, or to, to various other um, organizations and nations in order for their migration flows to be controlled on these areas. And um, we have heard um, from Peter about the experiences of mobility in Africa and how much it is becoming easier. And in, in that case, uh, we think that's moving in the right direction and we hope that they make it even more easier. 
So the question and what um, Rhonda has talked about is that there need to be, uh, we need to tackle not only um, um, migration, intercontinental migration or international migration, but rural urban migration by uh, providing positive alternatives such as, um, um, such as um, vocational colleges and skills that equip people with ways that they can become uh, productive in their local com communities. Um, I would like to thank all of you that took part in this um, in this um, discussion. And for, if you have a questions right now, please uh, may, may I ask the host to give us at least five minutes to get any questions that we may have for the people may, who have any questions. Uh, so please um, just unmute yourself and ask a question to any that you may have. I will start asking a um, <laughs> the usual kind of question that you ask. Um, thank you, first of all. It was fascinating to listen to your contributions and also how these different perspectives adding up. Um, and um, Tiziano and Jarina, thank you so much also for those insights to um, yeah, the terrible lack of morale and pretense of morale that we have here in Europe, really. I thought it would be good if you guys can give a shout out to um to let us know how we can support your really important work so um let's go oh sorry we can't hear you Geraldine. uh i think Geraldine is gone and don't know if it's gone only for me or for everyone oh maybe our time is up so um, I think what Geraldine was saying is that you can give us a shout out, uh, Mediterranean, um, and especially also Law Hub in Nairobi, how people can support your work. Um, so please, uh, let's start with uh, Mediterranean. Yes, just a second. <laughs> No. Um, yes, I think uh, there are a lot of ways in which you um, or everybody can support our work basically by understanding, by talking about it and by making people aware of uh, what's happening, but also in the more practical uh, way is through donations, because uh, we live thanks to those donations. We, uh, we do have a boat that is now uh, sequestered, but we want to buy another one and be able to save more human lives. So it's, it is about uh, donating. So everybody can contribute in um, the smallest way possible or not through a permanent donation or an occasional one. It is it is up to you, actually. So you can support us, Mediterranean Berlin, um, or directly Mediterranean Saving Humans. Uh, we'll start a new campaign of um, getting more members and of uh, making us, or making ourselves uh, more known on an international level um, on the 15th of December. So we hope to um, convince more people to be a part of this initiative uh, in a more, let's say, uh, practical way, because uh, it is good to know a lot of people stand with us, but it's also better to know that they can actually support us and make it happen um, on a real basis, so to say. So if we can uh, count on uh, more people's donations and more people as members and as active participants to our initiative, because we need also activists who live because and thanks to the work of activists and their um, their efforts, then uh, we can consider ourselves uh, lucky, and um, we we thank you all for your your support. So we need and, it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It was a very spontaneous oh, um, thank you. call, but thank, thank you, you, everybody. It was uh, it was a good contribution. Thank you so much, and Linda, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for having us as well. And um, we, if you want to be in touch with the Lawyers Hub, it's uh, just go to lawyershub.org um, and you can be a member of the Africa Law Tech Association. I think through that we'll be able to sort of feed into each other. We're really hopeful that we could do more research on tech and migration. I think there's still a lot of work that's not done yet in Kenya and um, just across East Africa. We'd be happy to engage on that um, and just have this sort of cross-pollination of all the work that we are doing. But thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Um, I'll give over now to, 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 to Geraldine to, to, to close up and um, maybe will tell us what are the next plans for today. 
Thank you, Tamar. I'm so sorry my internet crashed just as I asked my question. I got it <laughs> um, answered. <laughs> perfect, and I made it back just in time. So um, I would like to first of all thank you so much for this wonderful session. We were so lucky to be able to host DOTS in Nakuru together last year. And of course, it wouldn't have been the DOTS without um, without Rogue and Geek doing something together. And there was so many yeah, really fascinating inputs. So I'd really like to thank you for putting this great panel together today. And of course, just an open invitation to everybody who joined this session. Also, thank you for all the people who joined and, and your active um, participation. 